Civil Society is trying to push for actress, dancer, activist, author of 36 books, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Oh God. I stopped speaking for almost six I was hospitalized. He had told me if I ever told, he would kill my brother, who was the only person I loved. It's impossible to define an author, a poet, a civil rights activist, an actress, a dancer, taught by her grandmother to celebrate life to the fullest. She would need to keep her grandmother. Hello. Today we're going to discuss Maya Angelou. She's a poet, she's a writer, and she's about 20 dozen other things too. I didn't know very much about her until I did the research for this one, and I discovered that she is a truly remarkable woman. The name of our program is Singing a Song of Life, and it's her amazing journey through what, I mean, anyone would say has to be an incredible set of life experiences. We don't know her by this name, but we know her by this face. Her name is Marguerite Annie Johnson. And I guarantee you, most of you listening to this who know the work of Maya Angelou have no idea that that's her birth name. She was born on April the 4th, 1928, and she passed away on May 28th, 2014. The first time I became aware of her to know who she was and, and what she was, was in January of 1993. That was when she read an original poem that she had written, especially for the inauguration of President Bill Clinton. And she read it in his inauguration ceremony, and it was absolutely beautiful. She was the second poet ever invited to read an original work um, at an inauguration for an American president. The first one was Robert Frost. He did one for John F. Kennedy. His poem was The Gift Outright, and he read that one in 1961. When I heard her read her poem, which is entitled On the Pulse of Mourning, I was struck by several things. First, she has a very memorable, very wonderful, deep voice. It's distinctive. You hear that voice, you know that's Maya Angelou. The second thing that struck me was her very professional way of presenting. I didn't know at the time that she was a, an accomplished actress. I didn't know that she had done a lot of work on stage. Had no idea about that. I just knew that she knew how to read her poem most effectively. And then the third thing that struck me after I listened carefully to the words of that poem, was that hers is a rare talent. She can not only deliver well, but she also writes words that are well worth listening to. This is a picture of her when she's doing her poem, reciting it, reading it for the inauguration. The poem itself does several things. First of all, it calls for peace. It calls for racial and religious harmony. And it calls for social justice for people from all different backgrounds. It echoes Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream uh, speech. One of the lines in On the Pulse of Mourning is, give birth again to the dream. She issues a challenge, and it's a strong challenge, to this new administration that's coming in on this day, and to all Americans to work together for progress. This poem earned her the first of three Grammys that she would win. In 1993, the year that she read it, she won a gra Grammy for the best spoken word of that year. I wasn't the only one who heard her that morning and came away impressed. Uh, you can tell sales are a good marker of whether someone is hot again, good, interesting. Her poetry and her prose sales jumped right after the inauguration. Poetry sales went up 300%. Remember, she's done a poem at the inauguration, so people focus on that. Wow, that was good. What else has she written? Her prose sales went up 600%. 
So she did very well. It bumped at the right time for her. Her stage name is Mayu Angelou. You know now that's not her birth name, but it's the name that most people know her by, and, and, uh, and that's the name we're going to call her for today. I'm wondering how many of you know very much about her life story. I had no idea how complex it was. I had no idea the challenges that she faced. From her earliest childhood all the way through until her death, there were challenges. And she met everyone with a very special kind of courage. I've learned a great deal about her. I found her fascinating. And I found that she is much more than just a poet who happens to read a poem at a presidential inauguration. One of the best ways to learn about a famous person is to read his autobiography, if he bothers to write one. Granted, there's still a risk about the accuracy of what is written, because after all, the person writing the work is writing about that person's life, and so that person can conveniently forget a few things maybe that he or she doesn't want uh, put in to the story. As it turned out, Mayu Angelou spent a great deal of her prose writing time writing about her life. So I had lots of, of things to choose from, words from her. Between 1963 and 2013, she wrote seven books, all of which are, are concerning her own life and different stages in her life. You see them listed here. 1969 was her first, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. 1974 came, Gather Together in My Name. 1976, Singing and Swinging and Getting Merry Like Christmas. 1981, The Heart of a Woman. 1986, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. 2002, a song flung up to heaven. And then in 2013, Mom and Me and Mom. You notice that that last book, Mom and Me and Mom, has an asterisk by it. It's published in 2013. It's the last book in this series, but it may not belong in the series it may or may not actually qualify as an autobiography. More about this in a little bit. I was fortunate to find one book that held all six of the first, those books that are autobiographies or about her life. Uh, I found the one book that had them all, which made it infinitely easier. The name of it is The Collected Autobiographies of Mayu Angelou, and it's published in 2004 by Random House. It's excellent because each one of these books is printed in the chronological order that she wrote them. And so you can read the book, the collection, as a single book that just has these divisions which are divided by spaces in her life. Only Mom and Me and Mom isn't there. One reason is obvious. It wasn't even published until 2013. But it still may not quite be exactly like the other six. Fair warning to you. Even though she is a superb writer, not every one of these books is equally well written nor are they equally rewarding to you as a reader. So just be aware. Let's look at the first one. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, 1969. It talks about her childhood from the time she's about three until she's 16 and she's about to give birth to her child. It was nominated for a National Book Award in 1969, the year it came out, and it was made into a movie 10 years later. It's written in a very unusual, very innovative manner, and you know, we English majors are gonna pick up on this sort of thing. She's credited, though, with pioneering this particular way to write. 
this kind of thing. She used what she called fiction writing. It's a technique that uses dialogue and plot as well as made up stuff in her autobiographies in ways that hadn't been done before. This one of the six is considered her finest work. I'll tell you, it's my favorite of hers. I think it's the best written of all of the six. It's certainly her best known work. Critics loved it, and it set records on the amount of time that it spent on the you know, nonfiction bestseller list. Be aware, though, that this book, and frankly, all of the rest of them, even though the titles are light and are fascinating and make you want to read the book, what is that about? They're not all humor, and they're not all tale spinning. This particular one, the first one, deals with childhood rape, child abuse, and other very serious subjects. This is a book that's appropriate for the adult reader. It's a coming-of-age story of Angelou. She describes her childhood, the traumas, then the teenage conflicts. She's precocious, that's very clear, as she's recounting stories from her childhood. But she's also extremely insecure because she had long separations from her biological parents. That's book one. The second book is Gathered Together in My Name, published in 74. It picks up her life story when she's 17 years old, and now she's a brand new mother and panicked. It covers her life until she's 20 and her son is three. So it just covers three years. It describes her struggles as a single parent with a very young child, no money. She doesn't have education to speak of, and she's got not only to take care of herself, she has to take care of this, this little child. She worked any job she could find to be able to earn any money she could earn to be able to keep them alive. She worked as a cocktail waitress. She discovered that she had a talent for dance. She'd actually had dancing lessons early in her life, and, and she could hire herself out as a dancer and a calypso singer, which is kind of fun. The third book is Singing and Swinging and Getting Merry Like Christmas. I couldn't wait to read this one because the title is so interesting. This one actually talks about her very earliest experiences on stage, and it tracks her rise to become recognized as a very talented singer and dancer. It also concerns, a major part of it, her tour throughout Europe and Africa when she was selected to be part of the cast of the touring uh, company Porgy and Bess. And it ends when she comes back from that tour. So you've got a period of time when she's away. She separated from her son, Guy, and he is feeling abandoned. She felt abandonment when she was a child but she's just now growing up. So she has this chance to go to Europe and Africa and perform on stage and be paid for it and see all these places that she's read about, but she's you know, never experienced herself. So she kind of forgets her son for a while. And she goes and she has this growing up experience of life. When she came home though, she realized that her son was hurting the way she had been hurt from the time that she was separated from her biological parents. This was personal freedom for her for the very first time, and she loved it. During this time, she discovered that she had a talent for learning languages. And so by the second half of her life, in addition to English, Maya Angelou was fluent in French, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, and West African Fanti. The next book is The Heart of a Woman, published in 81. It starts in 1957, and it describes her acting and writing career when she moved to New York. And her early work, her early interest in what was just beginning to present itself, and that's the Civil Rights Movement. 
She reads her works, her original works, at the Harlem Writers Guild, and she meets their very serious writers who encourage her to continue writing. They sense that she has a talent. She's engaged to be married to a Bales bondman and is going to live in New York City happily ever after. But she meets a South African freedom fighter and she falls in love with him. And one day before her wedding is to occur, she leaves with him and ends up living with him in London and in Cairo. The next book is All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes. She lived in Ghana, Africa, for four years. And this is the book that talks about her experience as an African-American adjusting to living in an African-only country. Her son becomes critically injured in an automobile accident and she nurses him back to health. In the process, she realizes, wait a minute, he's, he's become a young man. I, I don't need to mother and smother him quite as much. So she decides, okay, I'm going to let him live his life. I'm going to move forward with mine. While she's in Ghana, Malcolm X, excuse me, Malcolm X comes and tours in the area and meets her. He asks her if she will return to the United States and help him in his civil rights work. She thinks, this is what I shall do. So she leaves her son, but her son is happy with this now. And she goes back to the U.S. and the son continues his education in Ghana. The book itself, I think, is most interesting because of the conflict that she feels as an African-American who's now in Africa and the assimilation is not as easy as she thinks it's going to be. The sixth book is A Song Flung Up to Heaven. It took her 15 years to write this one, much longer than any of the rest. It covers the four years from the time she gets back from Ghana to the moment that she sits down at her mother's kitchen table and begins writing, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. It's an interesting circular figure, these six books. It begins and it ends at the same point in her life. It's told when she was in her late 30s. Angelou, she leaves Africa, of course. She takes the job as a writer and an organizer for Malcolm X. But when she gets to New York, she decides she needs to go on to California. So she takes a month off before she goes back to New York and will begin actually working for Malcolm X. And during that time, he's assassinated. So she spends time with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and with James Baldwin. And in this book, she discovers actually she can write and that she should. These six books together are a remarkable telling of one woman's life story for the first half of her life, age three to age 40. Although each one begins more or less where the previous one left off, there are inconsistencies in these books especially in the later ones. The same episode she will, that she has mentioned in an earlier book gets a rewrite and some details change. That's why I love this collection because as you're reading, say, in book three and she mentions something and you think, oh, I don't remember it that way, and you go back to book one and you see the two different ways she tells essentially the same story. The first one she writes, she's 41 years old. The sixth one she writes when she's 74 years old. All six of these concern the first half of her life, but they're written during the second half of her life. Because of the way she did this, we know quite a lot about the first half of her life, not so much about the second 40 years of her life. Look at this chart. The first book is published when she's 41 years old. It spans her ages from two or three to 16. It's 14 years of life. The second one she writes when she's 46, and it talks about when she's 17 to 20, just three years. The third one she writes when she's 48. It covers the years of her life from 20 to 28, seven years. The fourth is when she's 53. 
And she's writing about when she was 28 to 32, four years. The fifth is written when she's 58. It covers 32 to 36, again, a four-year span. And then the sixth is written when she's 74, and it covers from 36 to 41, five years. Here's the important question. Is she really writing autobiographies, or is she writing memoirs? Small English lesson here, because this is important in terms of Mario Angelou. You've got a difference between an autobiography and a memoir. An autobiography is a chronological telling of one's entire life based on facts. Chronological telling based on facts. It is viewed as a history, a historical document, and it should be read as absolute truth, a factual and historical account of one's entire life from the beginning to the end. Memoir gives the writer more wiggle room. A memoir is a collection of memories. Based on the truth, the writer uses fictional techniques to engage readers and make the story more vivid. Remember I, we talked about her, that she was uh, very innovative in her writing of these kinds of books? Because she recounts dialogue, pages of dialogue of exact sentences each person speaking spoke. You can't do that from, from a perfect memory if you write it many, many years later. You're doing it from what you want the people who are reading your book, your memoir, to understand was the content of these important uh, conversations. While the stories are generally true in memoirs, not everything is true. It allows the author to share specific life experiences and what those have taught him. The memoir is written for one of several reasons, or sometimes a combination. It's written to search for personal identity. Who am I? Right now we have a number of, of uh, very modern uh, memoirs that are being written as people are soul searching, trying to find out who they truly are. Another reason for writing a, a memoir is it gives some insight into one's past. So you're, you're over in this half of your life, but you're looking back at that first half of your life and you're trying to figure out what happened back there that made you what you are today. And then the third one, people write memoirs to heal from a traumatic experience. Quite frankly, Nayu Angelou wrote for all three. The majority of scholars categorize her books as memoirs. They call her a memoirist. She explored themes of displacement and abandonment, racism, identity, gender discrimination, family, and travel through every one of those first six. James Baldwin, quite an established writer in his own stead, encouraged Angelou to write about her past living experiences, about her childhood, because she would tell stories to them when they'd sit around and have a drink, she and Baldwin, a few other people. She would just tell stories about what it was like to grow up in Stamps, Arkansas. He said that she must write it down and so she does, and that's how we got I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She said once, there is no greater agony than, be, than bearing an untold story inside of you. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. She had many untold stories that she needed to tell. For those that she did tell us, we learn a lot about her life. One of the most interesting things that I think Angelou said was this, quote, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. The reason that strikes a chord with me is because it speaks fully to her own life experience. There were many times in her life 
that she could have been destroyed if she hadn't had the courage to survive, but she did have the courage. And she was determined to succeed in all things in spite of many things that were working against her. As a result, she became an author, an actress, a screenwriter, a journalist, a dancer, a poet, a singer, and a civil rights activist. Not a bad portfolio. She wrote the six memoirs, plus that one other book that we'll talk about later, three books of essays, two cookbooks, several children's books, Hallmark greeting cards, and several books of poetry, as well as a number of plays, movies, and television show. She was a screenwriter. But who was she, really? We know from her books what she wants us to think she was, and, and that's warts and all, because she tells all of what happened. But I think there's more to her, because we've got that second half of her life, after she's 42, and before her death in her mid-80s. What, what was she? Let's see. To learn anything really about her, you have to look at her family structure. And this is her family, what she considered family and what was. You see here the mother, it's her biological mother, Vivian Baxter. She worked at different times as a nurse, as a car dealer in the casinos, and she went to sea as a seaman. She was also an absentee parent. Angelou's father was Bailey Johnson Sr. He was a Navy dietitian and then a hotel doorman and an absentee parent. She had one sibling, a brother, Bailey Johnson Jr. And the parents divorced when the two children were three her, she was three, and Bailey was four, and they were sent to live in Stamps, Arkansas, tiny little place, to live with their grandmother, Annie Henderson. Annie Henderson owned a general store in Stamps. She's the only black to own one, and she survived the Depression and World War II because she was very careful in what she sold. She sold the necessities, and she made very good investments. She accepted those two grandchildren into her home when her son sent them to live with her with love. Fine, she now had two little children. The children both called her mama, and they adored her. Miss Henderson actually married three times, but the children were not really aware of any of the three husbands because the marriages didn't really last all that long. She had a talent for sewing, not just for mercantile, but also for sewing. And so she made everyone's clothes except for her brother, Willie's. Angelou said that her father was the first cynic she ever met. When he came home from the Navy, he decided he was too good for Stamps, Arkansas. So he moved to California, and he worked there as a doorman for the Santa Monica Breakers Hotel. The relationship that Bailey Jr. and Angelou had with their grandmother was probably the strongest family tie either one of them had as children. Both of the children were scarred by the abandonment business. They both were well aware that they had been sent away by, to their grandmother by their parents. They carried a fear of being abandoned again all the rest of their lives, and that forged an unusual bond between them, very strong. One question I expect you've been wondering is, how on earth did Marguerite Annie Johnson become Mayu Angelou? When they were both very young, her brother finally realized that Marguerite was his sister. From that point on, he refused to call her Marguerite. Instead, he said that she was Maya's sister. And as they grew older, her new first name was shortened to Maya. And when he was successful, a grown man, he simply called her Mai. As an adult, Maya changed her last name to Angelou, 
which was a riff on her first husband's name, last name. He was a Greek, Angelopus. Part of her family, of course, is Uncle Willie. This is Annie Henderson's brother who lives uh, with them and works in the store. He was crippled as a child when the lady keeping him dropped him on his head, quite literally. It left him looking as though he were a stroke victim and he had difficulty moving. He didn't walk comfortably. His face was a, a little draggy on one side. He taught the children empathy because they watched how hard he worked every day in spite of his physical difficulties. He helped the children stay in line if it was necessary, but it wasn't very often necessary. Maya Angelou married three times, maybe four. When you read her six books, you might want to count as you go through because you can read it and think, okay, three marriages, and then you can read again, but wait, who is this? And he says he's her husband. Mm, not sure. These are the ones we're sure of. The Greek husband, Tosh Angelopoulos. He was a Greek sailor, a struggling musician, and occasional electrician when he needed some money. Their marriage lasted from 1949 to 1952. Then in 1960, she marries Maki. He's a lawyer, South African, anti-apartheid activist, and she's fascinated by him and by his work. And then that only lasted three years. Then in 1974, she married Paul Defoe, a Welsh carpenter and a painter, and that one ended in 1981. No children were born in her marriages. She had only her one child, Guy Johnson, whose father remains unnamed. She describes him, but she never gives his name. This is a picture of Mayu when she was about eight years old. The other person in her family is the villain. He is Mr. Freeman. He's Angelou's mother's current boyfriend when Bailey and Maya moved back to California to live with their mother. They're, they're of two minds about this. They really don't want to leave their grandmother, but they think this means that maybe their mother wants them back. So it's that abandonment thing going again. Mr. Freeman abused and then raped Maya when she was seven and a half years old. Maya told her brother, Bailey, Bailey told their mother, Mr. Freeman was arrested and stood trial, and Maya testified against him. His lawyer, after he was found guilty, his lawyer still did something, appeal or something, and got him out for a little while, during which time Maya's uncles, her mother's brothers, simply killed him, murdered him. And then the children were moved back to Stamps, Arkansas, to heal with their mama and Uncle Willie. Maya Angelou said this, I thought that I had caused the man's death because I had spoken his name. That was my seven and a half year logic. So I stopped talking for the next five years. And then she said, now to show you again how out of evil there can come good, in those five years, I read every book in the black school library. When I decided to speak, I had a lot to say, and in many ways in which to say what I had to say. In my case, I was saved by that muteness. I was able to draw from human thought, human disappointments and triumphs, enough to triumph myself. There are differing accounts about that five-year period. Some say that she did speak, but only to Bailey, only to her brother. Others take Angelou's word as the word and say she never spoke at all during that five years. She began speaking again when they, the children were moved back to California to be with their mother again. If you think about the abandonment theme, they've been abandoned twice. Both times, something different has happened when they go back. In this, she finds her voice. Her education, as I said, was a, a little sporadic. 
both of the children were voracious readers. Um, she, her grandmother, Mama, brought them books that she found and then got them books from the library. So when they went to California and enrolled in school, they were two years ahead of the same age children in California. And they'd been in Stamps, Arkansas, which wasn't supposed to have education at all. But you see, they were well read in Shakespeare and Kipling and Edgar Allan Poe, Thackeray, Henley, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Langston Hughes, James Weldon Johnson, important poets, those last three. She enrolled in George Washington High School in San Francisco, and it was okay, but she, she was already two years ahead in what she knew. When she was 14 years old, she was awarded a scholarship to the California Labor School, and that was where she took dance lessons and drama courses. And that's what opened up the possibility for her to become a, a stage personality. When she was 15 years old and the war was on, she applied to become a streetcar conductor. There were no women streetcar conductors. There were no black women streetcar conductors. She lied about her age. She said she was 19. And you can see from this picture here, that doesn't look like a 19-year-old to me, but she pulled it off. And she became the first African-American woman to work as a streetcar conductor in San Francisco. After about the equivalent of one semester, she went back to school, and she did graduate, this time from the Mission High School. When she was 16, she had a single encounter with a young fellow who lived nearby. Three weeks later, she discovered that she was pregnant. She told Bailey, their relationship is the tightest of all. She tells him when she's raped. She tells him when she's pregnant. Bailey says, don't tell because they'll make you get out of school and you need your education. She successfully hid her pregnancy until she was just over eight months along. Maya Angelou was six feet tall. I've always thought she was short. Mm -mm, she was six. Because she was six feet tall and with the ability to wear rather large, loose blouses, she managed to do it. She finally had to tell and her mother asked her two questions. She said, do you love the boy? She said, no. She said, does the boy love you? Angelou said, no. The mother said, fine, then our family will have this baby. I know why the caged bird sings ends with her son's birth. Most of the events in this part of her life are going to continue to impact her actions and her attitudes for the remainder of her life. This is why many believe that this book is her finest. One of the truths that Angelou lived her life by is this one, quote, never make someone a priority when all you are to them is an option. One of the most obvious long-term effects of the childhood rape and a very early pregnancy was that she couldn't sustain a marriage. She had developed such a strong sense of self-preservation that she had great difficulty settling into a traditional wife role. She also didn't have any role models in her family to show continued long-term, happy, blissful marriages, not even her grandmother. Ultimately, she gave up the idea of being married at all, and she settled into a very self-sufficient lifestyle that suited her best. That's the second half of her life. In 1950, when she was married to the Greek, her first husband, she developed a career as a calypso, Cuban calypso, singer and dancer. She developed her own act. And she became much more focused on developing a career than she did on her young marriage. And of course, it went away. Because she needed to take care of herself and her son, she early on determined that she would have a career of some sort. And so she tried a lot of different things, and she was good at just about all of them. By the time she was 40, Maya had worked as a short order cook my favorite one of those is when she went to cook 
at a restaurant that featured Creole food. She'd never tasted it. Plus, she didn't know how to cook. So she, she had no skills and she didn't know what she was trying to cook, but she found a way to learn. She also worked as a waitress, a madam, a nightclub entertainer, an actress, a theater director, a political organizer, a journalist in Africa, a newspaper editor in Africa, and a TV scriptwriter. And when she was 41, she emerged on the world stage as a writer with I Know Why a Caged Bird Sings. This is a picture. It's supposed to be taken in 1964. That's where the credit says it was. And it shows Malcolm X and Maya Angelou in Ghana. This is that period in her time when she knows she must find another life besides smothering her son. And Malcolm X presents the opportunity. As she recounts in the book, A Song Flung Up to Heaven, the sixth one, she leaves Ghana and she returns to the U.S. to work for Malcolm X and the civil rights movement. When she returns, as I told you before, she decides to go on to California and see her mother for a month. And while she's there, Malcolm X is assassinated. This is a picture of her with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Many of those closest from her advised her to pick up the work and go to work for Martin Luther King Jr. and be an organizer for him. Before she could begin working with him, though, she learns that he has been assassinated. He's assassinated on April 4th, 1968, which happens to be her 40th birthday. She goes into a deep depression. Several of her closest friends, including Baldwin, urge her to write down those stories about growing up in Stamps, Arkansas. And so she does. This is of a picture of her in 1970. This is the year after I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. It's just been published, and you can see in that face, I think, delight. I think she's also surprised that it went so well. What happened to her after she's 40? We have these wonderful books that tell us what she wants us to know about this period of time. What about after 40? Well, she wrote volumes of poetry. She found her voice as a poet. She was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for a particular work called Just Give Me a Cool Drink of Water For I Die. That was published by Random House in 1971. She received a lifetime appointment to be the Reynolds Professor of American Studies at Wake Forest University. That happened in 1982. And in 2010, she was awarded the Presidential uh, Order of Freedom by President Barack Obama. This is a picture of her receiving that medal. It's the highest civilian honor that can be given by the U.S. And it was given to her on February 15th, 2011. That's when the presentation was. When Obama was reading the citation before he placed the medal around her neck, he said this, As a girl, Marguerite Annie Johnson endured trauma and abuse that actually led her to stop speaking. But as a performer and ultimately a writer, a poet, Maya Angelou found her voice. It's a voice that has spoken to millions, including my mother, which is why my sister is named Maya. By holding on, even amid, amid cruelty and loss, and expanding her sense of compassion and ability to love, by holding on to her humanity, she has inspired countless others who have known injustice and misfortune in their own lives. One thing that we do know about Angelou's second half of life was that she maintained very close friendships throughout that last 40 years. This is a picture of her 
at uh, the 2002 Hallmark celebration of her accomplishments, and she seated with Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's widow. They became very close friends. And then there's Oprah. She met Oprah when Oprah was in her late 20s and she was working as a newspaper reporter. They became very close friends for the remainder of Angelou's life. And one of the things that brought them together was that Oprah, too, had been raped as a child and had lived in a small town and had suffered similar traumas to Angelou. Friendships with women like Mrs. King and Oprah help sustain Angelou even when great sadness struck. Her brother, Bailey Johnson Jr. died in 2000. He had suffered a series of strokes, very disturbing for her. Remember, you strip it all away, Bailey was her heart more than any other person. There's not much written about him, so his adult life is kind of difficult to discern. He wanted to be private and she wanted to allow him to have his privacy, but she still dropped us some hints. In a song flung up to heaven, she tells us that Bailey has become a chef at a very fine restaurant in Hawaii and that he's going to make his home there. One thing is clear. Bailey remained a rock of stability for his sister throughout his life. While he maintained his privacy, he was still one of the most important people for her. But so was her son, Guy Johnson. This is a picture of them, uh, and they look quite a lot alike. I was fascinated to see, see what he looked like, what he was like. He turns out to be a writer and a poet, just like his mother. After he graduated from college in Ghana, you know, he'd sent mother back to the U.S. so he could have his own life. After he graduated from college there, he had several jobs. He managed a bar in Spain. He ran a photo safari service from London and Algeria to the Spanish Sahara. He worked on oil rigs in Kuwait. He is an international fellow an international child, which she would have wanted him to be. He married, he had two children, and we know for at least 20 years, he worked as a manager for the local government of Oakland, California. Good guy. This quote will lead us to that seventh book. The quote is, it's one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself to forgive, forgive everybody. Mom and Me and Mom was published in 2013. It turns out to be one of the last things that she wrote in prose. We need to take a close look at it because it's gonna tell us something about Angelou we can't get otherwise. If we just accept it as the seventh book in a string of autobiographies, we're gonna have one impression. If we see it, though, as a memoir that stands alone from the others, we're going to get a much richer reading experience. Scholars are divided about whether or not to include this book with the other six. The book retells many of the incidents that have been recorded in those earlier six books, and a number of those directly contradict what she writes in this one. It qualifies as what we called, call revision. It's rewriting history. She publishes it when she's 85 years old and she dies one year later. Why she wrote this one is a matter of significant conjecture on the part of scholars. One theory is that could this be an apology to her mother for her portrayal of her mother in those earlier memoirs. Another is, is it a fictional account of how Angelou, Angelou had wished her relationship with her mother to be instead of as it was? Or is it simply a flawed work written by an elderly writer who is perhaps confusing memory? 
2014, a year after that one comes out, she dies. Her obituary read this way. ABC News just did it complete. Famed poet and author, Mayu Angelou died this morning in North Carolina. She was 86. She'd been very frail and had heart problems, but she was going strong, finishing a new book, Angelou's agent, Helen Braun, told ABC News. I spoke to her yesterday. She was fine, as she always was. Her spirit was indomitable. You see in the picture of her that she's wearing tinted sunglasses. She was not blind, but she had a recurring problem with cataracts, so much so that during her later years, she was forced to wear tinted sunglasses, both inside and out. You may remember the picture of her receiving the Presidential Medal from uh, President Obama. She's wearing the sunglasses. She also, as she became increasingly frail, required a wheelchair, and that bothered her, but she pointed out she could still get around, so it was okay. This is a picture of the memorial service that was held for her, and as you might imagine, it was filled to the brim, and people outside as well. It was held on the campus of Wake Forest University. I glanced over that a little while ago, said that he was, she was the Reynolds professor. Look, an endowed professorship is a serious big deal, as many of you will know. And she taught classes at Wake Forest. And it was there that she did some of her finest work which never got published, of course, because she's teaching it to students. She asked to be cremated, and so she was. The service itself was a mixture. It had a little poetry, a little performance, and a little prayer. And all three of them celebrated her unique voice as she was a participant of all three. Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Clinton, and Cicely Tyson all spoke at the service. After she died, her net worth was estimated at $10 million. This is a quarter. I wonder if you've seen one. In January of 2022, the United States Mint issued the Mayu Angelou Quarter as the first U.S. coin honoring a black female and the first one issued in its, quote, American Women, close quote, series. The design shows Angelou with her arms uplifted. Behind her are a bird in flight and a rising sun, images inspired by her poetry and symbolic of the way she lived. The coin designer who works for the Mint, Emily Damstra, selected the purple martin, a songbird native to Arkansas, as the bird to be represented. One month later, after the coin came out, Guy Johnson, her only child, died at age 77. She once said, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some humor, some passion, some compassion, and some style. I think she did it. She did thrive. She enjoyed success in a variety of areas most of us would never have even considered doing. She lived with passion, and that passion was a passion for life. She was compassionate many times over, and often that compassion benefited people she'd never met and would never know. She had a delicious and naughty sense of humor, something that she often credited with her ability to survive. And she had a wonderful sense of style, but it was her own personal style, and she never wavered from it. I don't know, I think she was remarkable, and I hope you found her so too. And I hope you'll find the time, perhaps, to read her books these memoirs, I think you'll learn a lot. Thank you. A rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed. Shame, my rhyme. 
Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. 